Let's get started. Where is my PowerPoint? All right, so we have our acute complications of diabetes, which is our hypoglycemia, DKA, and HHNS. Hypoglycemia uh, is going to be, you know, the more common one that you see. My little ponytail thing is really bugging me. I realize how high it is. <laughs> um, I'm seeing it on the corner of my eye and it's bothering me. Um, anyway, hypoglycemia is going to be the one that you see more commonly um, and we need to know how to treat it. So hypoglycemia is our abnormally low blood glucose level between, you know, less than 50 to 60 and can be from too much insulin, oral hypoglycemics, too little food, excessive physical activity, and causes these symptoms there on the left-hand side, you know, headaches, sweatiness, blurred vision, ringing in the ears, heart, increased heart rate, hunger, trembling, anxious, irritability, um, weakness, or tiredness. Uh, when the brain... <laughs> Well, the brain can't store glucose or very, very little glucose on its own. So the brain needs glucose, needs a constant supply from the body. So if the body doesn't have it, the brain doesn't have that glucose to, um, to use. So that's also why when a patient is hypoglycemic, and as I, I believe I mentioned last week, why we check a blood sugar when um, a patient comes in with stroke-like symptoms because they can have some of those neurological effects that mimic stroke-like symptoms. So we always check blood sugars when patients come in um, for stroke-like symptoms as well. So once that those glucose levels get lower than that 60, 50 to 60 range, when it's getting lower than that, the brain just can't, it doesn't have any enough stored glucose. To use. So that's why it's really important that patients shouldn't be hypoglycemic for too long, that we need to correct it. So we have our adrenergic symptoms, which that is um, our sympathetic nervous system. So that is what triggers our sweating, tremors, tachycardia, palpitations, nervousness, and hunger when we have low blood glucose levels. And then you have the, your central nervous system. Um, that is then causes more um, those profound neurological type symptoms. So your inability to concentrate, headache, confusion, memory lapses, slurred speech, numbness of the lips and tongue, irrational or combative behavior, double vision, and drowsiness. Uh, that would, these would be more of our mild hypoglycemia and then our severe hypoglycemia can result in disorientation, seizures, and loss of consciousness. So those adrenergic symptoms are kind of like the starting point that you know, you get that cool and clammy, eat some candy, that saying um, is more from your adrenergic symptoms. <clears throat> the onset can be abrupt, unexpected. Symptoms vary from person to person, and they also vary related to the rapid decrease in blood glucose and their usual blood glucose range. So some patients um, you might be more symptomatic with a blood glucose of 50, uh, and others may not start getting symptomatic to like 30. Uh, it varies. It depends on what their normal blood glucose range. So someone who is very uncontrolled and their glucose levels are usually in the 200s, they might start getting symptomatic at 100 um, or you know 90. You know something that's actually not considered hypoglycemia, but their body's used to that high, that higher level of glucose, so they can start to become symptomatic at different levels. Um, and then there's a decreased uh, adrenergic response that may affect the symptoms in persons who have had diabetes for many years, um, probably related to the autonomic neuropathy. So <clears throat> with that too, um, some patients lose that adrenergic response that they've been diabetic for a number of years, and they may not become symptomatic until much, much lower. Um, you know, some people can be completely comatose with a glucose of 40, while others are still kind of just have that cool and clammy type symptoms at, you know, 30. So it can vary widely from person to person. But the main thing being too, that once you get less than that 50 or 60 range, regardless of how um, <clears throat> um, symptomatic you are, your brain still is deprived of that glucose when you start getting below those levels. So management, we treat it as quick as we can. Um, and generally speaking, it's the 15-15 rule. They get 15 grams of that fast-acting concentrated carbohydrates, um, and then you retest in 15 minutes. 
you retreat if they are less than 70 or if their symptoms are still persisting longer than that 10 to 15 minute period um, if testing is not available. So if for whatever reason um, you can't retest them with the glucometer um, within 15 minutes and their blood glucose levels are still low uh, or and they're still symptomatic, you would just still keep treating them until they're no longer symptomatic. So those fast acting carbs, um, <clears throat> glucose, your three to four glucose tabs, juice, regular soda, not the diet soda because it doesn't have that sugar and car uh, those um, high content of sugar in it, six to 10 hard candies, two to three teaspoons of honey. And you always want to provide a snack with a protein and carbohydrate unless um, they're getting ready to eat within 30 to 60 minutes. And that chart, I, every semester I keep meaning to delete it and I always forget because I'm quite certain that is not the accurate page number or anything anymore because <laughs> we've, you know, changed editions, new editions and everything. So I know there's good charts in your book. I just don't think that's the actual page number and maybe not even the right chapter. I don't even know. I keep meaning to delete that. <clears throat> so, um, and just remember too, so this would be all your, your patients that could actually eat or um, are at least uh, awake enough, you know, they're obviously you can't give these things to someone who's in a comatose state if their glucose levels are that low. Um, but if they're, you know, moderately hypoglycemic and symptomatic, you can give them the oral um, options. And then also keeping in mind those, remember those drugs, um, those starch blockers, the um, uh, ones, um, Meglidol, Meglidol and Acarbos, those starch blocker ones that um, block the absorption of carbohydrates, so they may not respond as quickly. <clears throat> so then if they can't take oral or they don't have an NG tube that you can give like juice through or a peg tube or something like that, that you could um, give some of those options for, then we go to our IM or our IV um, or sub Q. Um, usually glucagon is given IM, uh, but if, if they don't have IV access, like if you're in long-term care or something and they don't have an IV, that glucagon um, sub Q or IM is an option. However, in the hospital setting, most of our patients have IV access, so usually we will go to the D50. So you either give a half amp or a whole amp, kind of depends on, usually um, if you have like a standing order for uh, D50, it'll, it'll say give half amp, which half amp would be your 25 mils, or a whole amp, which is the 50 mils, depending on what their glucose levels are and like, you know, how symptomatic and stuff they are. Um, <clears throat> so our uh, D50, has anybody ever given D50 before? No. It pushes like mud. It is super viscous and sticky. And like, if you get it on your gloves or your hands or anything, it is super sticky. I mean, it's 50% dextrose. So it pushes very, very hard. Um, so don't be surprised when you give it the first time that you're having a heart. And it's a big syringe too, it's 50 milliliters. So it's a big syringe and it's really hard to push. So that's normal. So don't think that the IV is bad or something. It could go bad though, because it is so viscous. So you really wanna be watching your site really closely as you're pushing it. <clears throat> um, but the other thing just, you know, for in, in practice, little, you know, tips, just make sure you always flush your IV after you give dextrose, especially, I mean, you should be flushing it after any medication, but especially um, your D50, because otherwise it's just gonna, that dextrose will crystallize um, like in the IV line and just clot it off. So flush your IV site really well after you give D50 because it will destroy it if not. Um, so if for whatever reason, you know, the IV site goes bad or they don't have the IV access, just know then that that glucagon um, is always an, a potential option as well. All right, so our DKA, so now we're going to go back to our DKA and our HHNS in more depth. So as mentioned last week, DKA is a result of not having the insulin because the insulin is what um, pushes our glucose into the cells and the cells use it for energy. But if we don't have insulin, the glucose can't go in the cells and then the cells use um, fat as energy and break that down. And that's what causes our ketosis. So that's what throws our patient into ketoacidosis. 
So the big differentiating factor between our DKA and our HHNS is the lack of insulin and the ketosis. They'll still have the hyperglycemia and dehydration, just like with HHNS, but the, uh, the other factor is the acidosis. So with our, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned last week, dehydration is the, the big um, thing that needs corrected right away with our electrolyte disturbances because they're severely dehydrated because of their polyuria. You know, they're just dumping a bunch of urine um, from that um, diuresis and <clears throat> that needs corrected as soon as possible. Um, but the manifestations, polyuria, polydipsia, blurred vision, weakness, headache, anorexia, and then the abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, acetone breath, hyperventilation, who small respirations and mental status changes. So those middle things, your abdominal symptoms, as well as our um, acetone breath, hyperventilation, those are all a result of the acidosis. So you won't see those things with your HHNS patients, but you will with your DKA. So here's the pathophysiology of DKA. So you have your lack of insulin. So the left-hand side is basically just your hyperglycemia, whereas the right-hand side is your pathophys of DKA. So you've got that increased breakdown of, of fat, which causes those increase in fatty acids and the ketone bodies, which then results in the acidosis. So the acetone breath, poor appetite, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and increased respirations. So <clears throat> um, this is a prime example of when you think of your ABCs, your, that's not the concern here, even though the patient presents like it's a, a breathing problem. You know, it looks like, you know, their respirations are 40 and they're just super, um, their pH, you know, you do ABGs and their pH is like 6.8, something crazy like that, but they're just like huffing and puffing away. Um, so you think airway is the problem, all right, we need to treat the airway, let's intubate or do something like that, but that's not the problem. The body is doing what it's supposed to do to try and correct the acidosis. The body is trying to compensate. So it's essentially a good thing that, that they're trying to blow off um, some, of that ac some of that acid. So this is the, the prime example of if you get a question, and, it, and it, the answer is an airway, you know, oh, we need to do airway. Airway is always our, our answer, but that's not the problem here. It's the lack of insulin that is causing the acidosis, that's causing the increased respirations. So you always got to look at the big picture, like what the actual problem is and know how to correct that. So assessment um, with our DKA, um, <clears throat> The blood glucose is between three and 800. I mean, that's just really don't even look at the glucose levels. It really doesn't matter what the glucose levels is. It depends on if the patient's in a state of acidosis and if they have ketones and that in their urine and how their serum osmolarity. So it's not diagnosed dependent on their glucose levels. It's, it's all the rest of the labs that we need to take a look at. So anytime you see the glucose levels, don't just think because it's this number, it's DKA, or because it's, or it's this number, it's HHNS, because it can be across the board. It does, the severity of the case does not depend on the glucose levels. <clears throat> so ketoacidosis then is reflected by the low serum bicarb and low pH, low PCO2 because they're blowing off that CO2 with their small respirations. They've got the ketone bodies um, in their blood and urine, and then their electrolytes are gonna vary according to their water loss and level, level of hydration. So um, uh, typically they're gonna be se severely hypokalemic um, and hypernutremic, you know, severely dehydrated. So again, like a broken record, correcting um, that dehydration and their electrolytes are a big component with treatment here. So prevention, um, <clears throat> you're going to assess for the underlying cause. It could be a result of disease, uh, an illness, maybe they've been sick and not able, you know, just not taking care of themselves, not taking their insulin, or maybe they're new, newly diagnosed, or um, they're just non-compliant. We know that non-compliance is oftentimes a big issue. So figuring out what the underlying cause is, of course, is always um, a 
prevention measure after you get them through this emergent phase. So, you know, more teaching and those type of things afterwards. So rehydration of IV fluids, I already mentioned that, and then the IV insulin. So with your um, insulin, so we know that the insulin is in, more important, it's important with both DKA and HHNS, but it's even more so important with our DKA because that's the only thing that's gonna start to reverse that acidosis. Um, so making sure that you rehydrate, you're um, getting the electrolytes corrected and getting that insulin started as soon as possible. We know that rehydration is the easiest to do because it's just a matter of throwing some fluids up and getting that started right away to help correct that um, dehydration. Um, <clears throat> when you're administering um, IV insulin though, this is just a sidebar um, in practice thing that you should know because it varies from hospital to hospital. Um, it's really important to prime your IV tubing with at least 20 to 30 mils of the insulin, like you know, through the tubing into the trash because that insulin adheres to the IV tubing um, until, you know, until enough is adhered there, basically the patient is only getting saline. So it's really important to make sure you're priming that tubing or using a special tubing. It depends where you work. Some, some facilities um, might have special IV tubing um, that prevents that insulin from adhering to the tubing, um, but others, most, most places I've worked anyway, just use regular IV tubing to give insulin. So you just have to make sure you're aware of that, that you prime it well with that insulin first. Because if you don't, so if you start your um, insulin drip out, you're using your endo tool or glucomander or whatever program it is that you're using, it tells you what to start your insulin at and you're plugging in your glucose level every hour or 30 minutes sometimes. And it tells you what to continue to go up um, on the rate. So if you start out at like two units an hour, and their glucose level is still just high and it's not coming down, it's gonna keep telling you to go up and up and up on the insulin. Well, then after an hour or two, all of a sudden they bottom out because the program now has them up to like 20 units of insulin. And now all of a sudden the, the tubing isn't adhering to that insulin anymore and they're getting essentially like a bolus dose of insulin. So you, it's, that's why it's really important to make sure that you know either what type of um, tubing you're using or that you're priming your tubing adequately with that insulin so that way to prevent that from happening. Those programs are only as good as um, the user. So if you aren't doing some of those things, the, you know, the, the program doesn't know that they essentially aren't receiving any insulin. Uh, so they're gonna keep, it's gonna keep, keep telling you to go up and up and up and may even tell you to give bolus doses um, because the insulin or the blood glucose level isn't responding. <clears throat> so just a little sidebar because it's an important sidebar. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then reversing the acidosis, again, that will come um, when the insulin gets on board, but you may have to give uh, some bicarb depending on how acidotic they are. And then that rehydration leads to that plasma volume and a decrease uh, in, in increased plasma volume and a decrease in the potassium because that's going to lower the potassium as well. And then the insulin is going to lower the potassium as well. Um, in, from the extracellular fluid into the cells because insulin is what's going to push that potassium back in to the cells and they're still going to have significantly low um, potassium levels. So monitoring their blood glucose and renal function, their urine output, we know that severe dehydration can cause impaired kidney function, which we're going to talk more about when we get to the renal. Um, so making sure you're monitoring the renal function and their urine output. Um, EKG and electrolyte levels, of course, because of the potassium, vital signs, lung sounds, signs of fluid overload, especially if they have any uh, history of cardiac issues. We know that when we're giving all these, this fluid, all that fluid bolus, um, it can really um, could back up in the system and they could go into pulmonary edema or something like that. So making sure you're assessing for those signs of fluid overload is really important as well. All right, so our HHNS, hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome. So our HHNS is still a serious condition in which osmo, uh, hyperosmolarity and hyperglycemia uh, predominate. So ketosis though is absent because they lack effective insulin. So they have just enough insulin that it prevents that ketosis from occurring. 
It often occurs more in older people, so 50 to 70, uh, who have no known history of diabetes or have type 2 diabetes. So as I mentioned last week, DKA can still occur in our type 2 diabetics if it's severe enough or if they've been, um, if they just significantly lack that effective insulin enough that they just basically don't have any that is, can cause them to still go into a state of ketosis. But um, textbook wise, we are gonna go with the kind of rule of thumb that our DKA is generally our type one, younger-ish patients, and our um, HHNS is more of our type two, older population. You know, maybe they, um, have never been diagnosed with diabetes and now they're just now being diagnosed with type 2 and they come into the hospital with severely elevated blood sugars. So <clears throat> generally speaking, that's what we're going to go by. <laughs> so it can be also traced to a precipitating event such an, as an acute illness. So either one, um, either your DKA or HHNS can still be caused by some illness that's causing their glucose levels to rise. Uh, and medications that exacerbate hyperglycemia, so are thiazides, steroids. Steroids are a big one that can cause um, hyperglycemia. So maybe they didn't know they were diabetic and they got put on steroids for, you know, uh, I don't know, some COPD or something like that, that then triggered them to go into an HHNS with these severely elevated glucose levels. Treatments, dialysis, kidney disease in general um, can affect diabetes as well. History um, can usually include days to weeks of polyuria with adequate fluid intake. So <clears throat> um, with this, um, they, since they don't have those other symptoms of acidosis with the nausea, vomiting, abdominal, severe abdominal pain, and the res increased respirations and stuff, they tend to not seek treatment as soon. So they, they just wait longer because they just think it's either, oh, it's just getting to be old age. I'm peeing a lot. I'm going to the bathroom a lot and, um, and they're thirsty. So it's just symptoms that they can manage that are just more so annoying until they get to be so bad that, okay, I can't, there's something going on. I can't handle this anymore. Um, so they just tolerate it. So here's our comparison, our DKA versus our HHNS. So DKA, no insulin is present, so it promotes that breakdown of the stored glucose, protein, and fat, which leads to the production of ketone bodies and ketoacidosis. And then HHNS, the insulin level is too low to prevent hyperglycemia and that osmotic diuresis, so they still have polyuria and the dehydration, um, but the level of insulin is just high enough to prevent that fat breakdown. They don't have those keto, uh, ketosis-related symptoms. Um, so they just tolerate it, as I already mentioned. <clears throat> so they're still going to have that profound dehydration. So they'll have those symptoms of that, our hypotension, tachycardia. They might have neurological symptoms, um, potentially seizures if it's severe enough, um, and hemiparesis. It can affect um, those, that neurological state. <clears throat> So there, again, gives a range of their normal, you know, their average blood glucose levels, but still don't concentrate on that. They tend to have higher glucose levels than DKA, um, but more so just because they, they wait so long to get to seek treatment because they don't have those same symptoms as DKA, as I already mentioned. So they tolerate it longer. So then their blood glucose levels tend to be higher by the time they come in and look, seek treatment. Uh, serum osmolality is still very high. And then their electrolytes and their BUN, creatinine, all that will still show dehydration. So they still have those same things, low potassium, high sodium, elevated BUN and creatinine as well. So we're going to treat it just similar as we do with our DKA, but insulin is still very important to get on board because it, that's what's going to um, bring down the blood glucose levels and kind of stop that um, osmotic diuresis, but it's not as, a, as important of a role as it is with DKA because it, it's not going to affect acidosis. So DKA needs that insulin on board to stop that acidosis cycle, <clears throat> but both need it to bring down the hyperglycemia and stop that osmotic diuresis. Uh, <clears throat> and then also with the insulin administration, after their glucose levels reaches around 250 to 300, you're gonna switch it to um, something with dextrose in it. Typically like your D5NS or D5W, 
you know, just like your 5% dextrose, because once I get to, down to that like 250 range, if they drop too quickly, it can cause seizures. So if you drop that blood glucose level too quickly, it can cause problems, um, neurological problems. So generally speaking, patients are often um, NPO and, or at least, you know, maybe just only water or just nothing with calories or glucose or bleh, like carbs, nothing like that. So just simple water or ice chips or something might be okay by the physician. Um, but typically they want them to be NPO. Um, so that way they can have that really, really tight control of their glucose levels as they're on that insulin drip and bringing it down. So then once they get to that range, um, and really these programs, if you guys have ever had the opportunity to work with one of these uh, programs like EndoTool or uh, Glucomander, they're awesome because they, I mean, you can like put in every little detail um, for the patient so that way you can really fine tune the best um, optimal insulin dose for that patient. You put in what type of diabetes they have, um, if they're on steroids, their BMI, their BUN and creatinine, um, all these factors that can influence how much insulin they should receive. And then it'll even tell you, it'll give you the option to, let's say the physician does say that they can eat, um, you know, just snacks or whatever, like some small snacks. Um, you can even put that in. Like when you check the glucose levels then it says, did the patient eat? And if you say yes, you can say if it was a full meal or if it was just like a snack, like it can, it'll titrate it like very, very tightly. Um, and then once it goes down to that 250 range, it will even pop up and say, we recommend uh, starting this patient on something with dextrose, you know, I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but it like, it, it makes it foolproof and it's really, really nice. Other than like um, old school, <laughs> when we used to titrate insulin with our paper order, that's like, okay, if the insulin or the glucose is this level, you increase by two units. If this level, you decreased by two units or whatever it was, very non-patient specific. So these things are a really, really good tool and really help manage these patients in HHNS and DKA. So, but the important thing is to just get that dextrose started um, so that way they don't bottom out too qu quickly. You're not gonna give anything, usually not even like D10 or anything quite that um, concentrated with dextrose, but usually something like D5 will be started. <clears throat> All right. That was it with that. Do you guys have any questions specifically with our DKA and our HHNS? This stuff helped me a lot over the weekend. <laughs> Just what we already talked about last week, because we had two. And one of them, she was nonverbal MR. Um, she had Down syndrome. She was like a baby, and I wanted to take her home. Oh. But she was having seizures, and she couldn't, like, she couldn't verbalize anything to us. So that was hard, but it was awesome. Like I got to sit in there with, with her because we didn't want her to be alone and have a seizure. Mm -hmm. And so getting to like actually sit and watch and recognize the things that be like, Hey, somebody come help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It always helps pulling it into practice, learning about it and getting to see it in practice too, for sure. Okay. So renal. Ready to talk about the kidneys? You're in luck. But um bump. <laughs> you don't like that, Lauren? Ugh. I I just make myself laugh. <laughs> All right. So I actually saw that. It was like a Pinterest meme or something, and it made me giggle. So I say it all the time now when I start my kidney lecture. All right. Um, so A and P. So a little refresher here. Um, you have two kidneys. You have two ureters, you have a bladder and a urethra. Males have a prostate. So there's your A&P review. And so our kidney is broken into three major areas, which is our renal pelvis, our cortex, and our medulla. And in our cortex is where our nephrons are stored. And um, we have about, well, about 90% of the nephrons are in our cortex and our nephrons are what do all the work. And there is about a million um, nephrons per kidney. So we have about 2 million nephrons uh, between both our kidneys and we only need 500,000 for adequate kidney function. So that's why you can live with one kidney without any problems for the rest of your life. So if you, you know, either donate or 
um, lose a kidney to, for whatever reason, cancer or something, you can still li live a completely normal life with one kidney. Um, dialysis patients, by the time someone is down on dialysis, they have at least, <clears throat> they're down to about less than 25% of those nephrons. All right, so we have um, the functions of the kidney, which a little acronym to remember that is a wet bed. So um, A uh, is our um, acid-base balance. So with our acid-base balance, um, our kidneys secrete hydrogen ions and reabsorb them, uh, or and reabsorb sodium and bicarb, and they also produce ammonia. And then uh, W is our water removal and regulation, which that's done through two main hormones, which is our ADH, our antidiuretic hormone, and um, aldosterone. So those help keep our acid, or I'm sorry, our water regulation. Then erythropoiesis, so that is our red blood cell production. So our kidneys help promote that red blood cell production. So that's often why our kidney or our patients in kidney failure have uh, anemia because their kidneys aren't able to do that erythropoiesis adequately. Toxin removal, we know that our kidneys filter a lot of stuff. So they are a key player in our toxin removal. Uh, blood pressure control, so that um, goes along with um, the angiotensin II and our renin um, and aldosterone. Those all play a factor that are produced in our kidneys that um, control our blood pressure. Electrolyte balance, almost most of our, most of our um, electrolytes are reabsorbed in the kidney. So uh, sodium, chloride, potassium, bicarb, calcium, phosphate, all those are um, reabsorbed in our kidneys and our, our, in the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule to be exact. And then D is our vitamin D metabolism. Our kidneys play a big role in that. Uh, vitamin D is absorbed through our skin, as we know, um, and it, then it's processed in the liver, but it's then turned into its active form in the kidneys, which then we need to absorb calcium. So it all plays a role together. So here's a close-up little picture of what a nephron looks like. So we have in the center there is our glomerular, glomerular, glomerulus. I am I have a really hard time saying that word, um, but that is where we get our GFR, our glomerular filtration rate. Our GFR is the rate that blood flows through the glomerulus. Um, so that's you know we need a good GFR to have adequately functioning kidneys. That those nephrons need a good GFR. Um, typically, we can have an adequate GFR when our MAP um, is between 80 and 100, but once we start getting less than 70, they start to lose some of that auto regulation. And then once it's less than 60, it can be very detrimental to our kidney perfusion. So that's why you often see physicians' orders say, um, I'm sorry, did I say, was I talking about the MAP? The MAP between 80 and 100, and then Less than 70, the MAP less than 70 loses auto regulation, and then less than 60. Did I say MAP or was, did it make it sound like I was talking about the actual GFR? The normal, our normal GFR, um, it says like greater than 125, um, but typically greater than 90 for a GFR is considered um, normal. I mean, most patients, um, as, long as, as long as their GFR is greater than 90, you know, physicians are happy. Um, but we need a good map to maintain that good GFR. So then when you see um, physician's orders to keep a patient's blood pressure up, sometimes they'll just say great to keep systolic blood pressure greater than 90. But we know that even though a blood pressure can be greater than 90, their map might be less than 60. So especially kidney doctors, or if it is a patient in with kidney problems, will specifically say titrate, you know, whatever the medication titrate dopamine to keep um, uh, MAP greater than 60 instead of their systolic blood pressure. Because you could have a decent MAP actually, even with a blood pressure of like 85, depending what your diastolic is. Uh, so knowing that their MAP though is at least perfusing and the kidneys are staying perfused is the most important part. So we really need to keep that MAP at least above 60. Some even say 65. 
Um, it just really depends kind of on the physician. Um, <clears throat> but then we have our um, diagnostic tests. So we know that BUN and creatinine are our big diagnostic tools to determine kidney dysfunction, but our BUN can be elevated for other reasons besides kidney dysfunction. Does anybody, what, what is one of the big things that can cause our BUN to be elevated even though they may not necessarily have kidney dysfunction? Dehydration. Yeah, dehydration. So patient, even if they're just significantly dehydrated, their BUN might be high, but their creatinine not necessarily and um, just they just might need some fluids and that's it. So, <clears throat> but the creatinine, creatinine is our big indicator of um, kidney dysfunction because there's no other um, pathological, true pathological reason for creatinine to be elevated other than kidney failure or kidney you know, at least acute kidney failure or whatever the case may be. Um, some, some conditions like MI, um, because creatinine is um, excreted when muscle, when there is like some muscle damage um, and protein breakdown and stuff, uh, other things can cause, like every once in a while you'll see a creatinine level be slightly elevated, um, like with a patient with MI, but it's not going to be like five. Their creatinine is not going to be five after an MI. It might be like one point six or seven, you know, just, just a little elevated because, you know, our normal creatinine is right around one. I know there's different levels between male and female, but generally, if you just remember that your creatinine should be right around one, uh, that's what a normal creatinine level is. So our creatinine is going to be our big indicator because our BUN can be elevated yet yeah, for dehydration. Steroids can elevate your BUN, infection. Uh, there's different factors that might elevate your BUN. So it's not the end all be all as to whether or not they have kidney dysfunction. <clears throat> Your analysis, if a patient is having some kidney issues, they will have, um, the big things that they will show in their urine is protein and glucose. So protein are large molecules and if they have gone through the kidneys, if the kidney is dumping protein, then um, that is an indicator that there is some uh, damage to the kidneys going on. And um, glucose, they might have glucose in their urine nine times out of 10, not, I don't know, maybe not nine times out of 10, but a lot of patients who are in renal failure are diabetic, but they might have glucose in their urine and not necessarily be diabetic. And that's because the renal threshold for glucose is right around 220. So if it goes over 220, like in the case of our diabetics, they start dumping glucose into the urine. But if they have kidney failure or disease, um, then that renal threshold for glucose might just be lower. So maybe now their threshold for glucose is only like 100. So they'll start, start dumping glucose into the urine anytime their glucose levels go greater than 100. So it may not necessarily be that they're diabetic, but that just because they have some kidney dysfunction, they start dumping glucose in the urine because of that lower renal threshold for glucose. And then you have your urine culture and sensitivity. Of course, that will help rule out if it's a result of any infectious process, maybe glomerular nephritis, uh, pyelonephritis, those type of things. Uh, creatinine clearance test is gonna be our 24 hour urine. So your creatinine clearance test is when um, they need to do a urine sample or void in the morning and then that's when their um, 24 hour urine would start. They don't collect that first urine of the day uh, but they void, and then that's when time, you know, zero starts. So then they start collecting for 24 hours, and then they have to have a blood draw of a random creatinine during that time frame as well. Um, so then that kind of helps give a, it's like a, uh, you know, an equation of sorts that determines how much creatinine is in their urine compared to their blood creatinine and that type of thing. <clears throat> and then um, KUB, kidneys, urine, or bladder, that's just basically an x-ray of those things. IV pyl pylography, that will take a closer look at the renal pelvis. CT and MRI, we know what those are, but what's some, what are things that we need to make sure we're, um, if, especially if it's a kidney patient, what do we need to check and make sure that if they're getting one of those that they hopefully are not receiving? Contrast. Yeah, contrast we know that the IV contrast um, <clears throat> can be really hard on the kidneys. So um, they should not be receiving any of the contrast with those uh, procedures. 
And then the renal angiography um, is just basically, again, just a closer look at the kidneys. Um, so with our, um, oh, I forgot. So the urinalysis, I forgot to mention this. The um, specific gravity is another, another thing that we check uh, with the urinalysis. And um, if the patient does have some kidney issues, we know that it you know, gets that really dark, concentrated appearance to it. So if the urine's more concentrated, will they have a higher or a lower specific gravity? Higher. Yeah, higher. So the, along with potentially the protein and glucose, they also typically will have a higher urine specific gravity as well. So one thing when it comes to um, <clears throat> this exam that I always like caution people for is making sure, maybe do like a table or something with your lab values um, with your DKA or, you know, your HHNS patients and your um, renal patients, because they're, they're opposite. A, a lot of things are opposite, like the urine specific gravity. Obviously, if they're diuresing, they're going to have a lower urine specific gravity because the urine is just like water, you know, it's just super clear and just a ton of it. Whereas with renal disease, you're, it's going to be more concentrated because, um, you know, they're retaining all that fluid. So that urine is going to have a higher specific gravity. And then um, things like the potassium are opposite, low potassium with um, the diabetic and then high potassium with your renal patient. So just be careful when you're taking this exam to really like concentrate on what the question is asking as far as it, is it a renal patient or is it a diabetic patient and making sure you straighten out those labs. I know many of you know what they are, but sometimes since it's on the same test, it's easy to get kind of like confused because you, you know, just your mind kind of goes in different directions. So that's my word of caution to you guys about this um, exam is to really nail down your lab values between the two. Okay. <clears throat> um, so diabetic nephropathy, it's a long-term complication of diabetes mellitus. We know that a lot of our renal failure patients are diabetic because whether they weren't controlled, didn't manage their diabetes well enough, and it led to um, renal disease. Um, atherosclerotic changes decrease that blood to the kidney. They eventually start needing smaller doses of insulin as it progresses, and it's related to the kidneys unable to break down insulin and excrete it, and then eventually chronic renal failure develops. So now we're going to talk about our acute kidney injury. We should be able to get through, I'm going to get through acute kidney injury and then um, we'll take a break before we get to chronic. <clears throat> so acute kidney injury, um, the old name is acute renal failure, uh, but really you still hear, hear people call it acute renal failure, but it's basically the sudden loss of kidney function. It can be a rapid onset of hours to days. Waste products accumulate, which leads to azotemia. That azotemia is what leads to that like uremic frost. It's just like an accumulation of those waste products or nitrogen and causes that itchy, you know, skin that has that, it's just called a uremic frost. Um, and then oliguria, which is um, output less than 20 mils an hour. Remember that the normal urine output should be 30 mils an hour. Or if they don't have a catheter that you're measuring their urine output hourly, less than 400 mils a day. Um, they may recover, and it's usually reversible, especially if you can catch it early enough. So the path pathophysiology, there's reduced blood flow to the kidneys. It can be a result of hypovolemia, hypotension, cardiac, decreased cardiac output, heart failure, obstruction um, of any part of the, of the urinary tract, uh, tumors. There could be an obstruction to the renal arteries or veins. All those things can cause acute kidney injury. So, but the main thing, it all leads to that decrease in the GFR and increased BUN and creatinine and oliguria. So there's three different categories of your acute kidney injury. Um, <clears throat> there's pre-renal failure. So pre, as the name implies, it's before. So it's a problem that's occurring before it even gets to the kidneys. So this is usually a result from a low MAP. So if you have a low MAP, your kidneys are not getting perfused, those nephrons are not getting you know, good perfusion and, and causes the GFR to drop. So there's a decreased blood supply to the kidneys um, and there's low, it's a low blood pressure in that renal artery. 
So when they're not receiving that blood, they're unable to make urine and the waste is not adequately removed. So just when you think of pre-renal failure for acute kidney injury, just always think before. So things like um, hypovolemia if they, or blood loss, something that's, again, not causing good um, perfusion to the kidneys, heart failure, those type of things are all going to be a result. It's not the kidney itself that's failing, but it's, it's not having perfusion or the adequate fluid or blood volume that it needs to stay perfused. Um, so I just said all those things. Um, <clears throat> shock is another one. If they're in a state of shock, um, can also decrease our cardiac output or vasodilation. So uh, when we think of vasodilation, we usually have hypotension with vasodilation. So again, if, they, if um, the patient's vasodilated, the blood is going to shunt from those less vital organs to the more vital, like the heart and the head, and it's not going to um, give the blood to the kidneys. Renal vascular obstruction. So again, the vasculature leading to the kidneys is going to cause pre-renal failure as well. Then with intra, um, intra-renal failure, intra-within, so it's something that's actually going on within the nephrons in the kidneys. Um, so it can be renal ischemia, myoglobinuria, transfusion reactions. Um, that myoglobinuria, uh, have, have you guys heard of rhabdomyolysis? So rhabdomyolysis um, sometimes occurs, like uh, oftentimes you see it in elderly patients or severe trauma patients as well. If they've had a lot of um, muscles. <clears throat> musculoskeletal damage, um, it ca can cause a release of that, um, those damaged skeletal muscles that the tissue breaks down so rapidly and just excretes that myoglobin. And that myoglobin that's trying to be filtered through the kidneys causes damage and because they're large particles. And then that leads the patient into a severe state of rhabdomyolysis, which is CK L levels are significantly elevated and their buon and creatinine rise as well because it damages the kidneys. But it's because of those large um, particles that myoglobin that's trying to go through the nephrons damages them. So it causes that intrarenal failure. Um, and then nephrotoxic injury, this is gonna be your more common um, cause of intrarenal failure your meds, your meds that are nephrotoxic. So you have a lot of antibiotics that are nephrotoxic, like vancomycin, uh, uh, Cipro is one, gentamicin. There's a, a lot of antibiotics that are, um, can be really nephrotoxic. So that's often why if a patient has a little bit of um, uh, kidney dysfunction, a physician might say, you know, whatever the, you know, vancomycin, pharmacy to dose because then pharmacy can check those lab values every day to, and titrate their antibiotic to make sure it's not gonna cause more damage. <clears throat> NSAIDs we know can be very damaging um, to our kidneys as well and contrast dye, so things that we've already talked about. And then our infectious processes. So infection that's happening actually within the kidney. So that pyelonephritis or glomerular nephritis, those things can cause intrarenal failure. And then there are some autoimmune disorders we know that can cause intrarenal failure. Again, it's the body attacking itself, so it's still considered an intrarenal um, failure, like with lupus and stuff, we know can be really um, a, an autoimmune disorder that's damaging to the kidneys. Then with post-renal failure, post, after. Post-renal failure, there is, it's generally an obstruction, an obstruction of something that's preventing the urine to leave the body. So it backs up and can cause damage to the kidneys. So those things such as um, urethral obstruction, so prostate problems, bladder cancer, a ureteral obstruction, renal calculi, so our kidney stones are actually considered a post-renal problem because our kidney stones don't occur within the nephrons. Those, they generally occur in the, um, the, the ureters or the calluses. So that's why Kidney stones are a post-renal failure problem. An abdominal tumor, if it's severe enough and it's pushing and causing an obstruction from the, ur you know, the urinary collecting system. And then um, spinal cord disease. So neurogenic bladder. A patient who's had spinal cord damage that can't empty their bladder can 
develop post renal failure if again they're not able to void and there that collecting system is just staying there and causes um, a buildup and that can cause uh, post renal failure. So signs and symptoms. I already mentioned the sudden or decrease in urinary output, generally less than 400 mils in 24 hours, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, sudden weight gain, they're gonna start retaining a lot of that fluid, decrease in their level of consciousness, halitosis as a result, just from those toxin buildup, it can get like a halitosis, um, low blood pressure, tachycardia, and tachypnea. So low blood pressure, I mean, we typically think that with renal failure, you know, they have more high blood pressure because of the fluid accumulation. But with acute kidney injury, they could have low, they could be hypotensive depending on the cause, especially if it's a, um, like a pre-renal failure, especially because of, um, you know, low cardiac output or hypovolemia, those type of things. So you'll see more low blood pressure with acute kidney injury as opposed to high blood pressure with your chronic. Four phases, so you have the initiation phase or the onset phase that starts with the initial insult and ends with oliguria. And it spans several hours to two days. And then renal function begins to deteriorate, but renal damage has not yet been established. And it is still potentially reversible during this phase, hopefully. Then you have the oliguric or the anuric phase. Here's where you have the increase in serum concentration of those normally excreted products. So your urea, creatinine, uric acid, potassium, and magnesium. So those levels will all be high with your acute kidney injury. Um, so those things are normally excreted, um, but then you'll have um, those, the high protein and the glucose, um, as mentioned before, potentially, potentially ketones as well. Um, but since the urea, creatinine, uric acid, and potassium, and magnesium are not being excreted anymore, the blood concentrations are going to be a lot higher. So again, you're going to have that high potassium with your renal patients as opposed to the, your low potassium with those diabetic patients. Um, <clears throat> and protein, so protein is not normally found in urine. Um, and I think uh, if you look in your ATI, if you do any of your reading in your ATI, it says like protein should be less than eight, but it's supposed to be 0.8. So it's like a typo in there. So it should be right on your lab value sheet um, handout, but just keep that in mind. If you read it in ATI and it says eight, it's supposed to be 0.8 because you should have little to no protein in your urine. Um, so anyway, this phase last, the urine volume is the lowest, hence the oliguric and uric phase. It lasts one to three weeks, and the longer they remain in this phase, the greater amount of renal damage. Uh, uremia and hyperkalemia are common during this phase. So again, they can get that like itchy uremic frost during this phase and that hyperkalemia. So if that hyperkalemia, which we'll talk more about the hyperkalemia and the, and the corrections of that with our chronic renal failure, but severe hyperkalemia we know can result in uh, dysrhythmia. So we need to be mindful of that. And then the diuretic phase, as the name implies, they're starting to diurese. The renal tissues recover and start to repair themselves. There's a gradual increase in their urine output. GFR is recovering. And in this phase, obviously, they may lose large amounts of fluid due to salt and water accumulation and can lead to dehydration. So we know that diuresis can lead to dehydration. And their urine cracking usually is still elevated during this phase as well. And then you have the recovery phase or the convalescent phase. It may take up to uh, three to 12 months, but their lab values do start to return to normal after the recovery phase. Medical management, restoring normal chemical balance, preventing the complications until repair of renal tissue and restoration of renal function occurs. We know we always wanna try and prevent complications and treating the cause. So depending on what type of problem it was, a pre-renal um, failure, of course, we're gonna to wanna to try and optimize that renal perfusion, bring up the blood pressure, restore um, fluid volume, maybe might potentially need to be on a, a presser of some sort. The, the main thing with pressers though, I may have already said this at one point, maybe when we talked about cardiac, um, but you really should not, if it's a, if it's a fluid volume problem, you should never start pressers until you correct the fluid volume problem because 
if you start a presser for a low blood pressure, but they have no fluid volume essentially to clamp down to, to, to vasoconstrict on, it's going to do more damage than good. So you always correct a fluid volume problem first before you jump straight to pressors. And it kind of, it goes along with that rule of, you know, kind of least invasive to more invasive. Of course, fluids are less potentially damaging than, um, than a presser could be. So you always want to correct with fluids first. Um, and then post renal, remove the obstruction. That's pretty, duh. you know, if it's a result of a, a kidney stone or maybe they've got a, a tumor, whatever the case may be, removing the obstruction hopefully can correct the problem with a post renal failure. Intra renal then, um, removing the cause, treating infection. <clears throat> that one definitely is a little bit more tricky, especially with infection, because as already mentioned, those a lot of antibiotics, um, like two thirds of all meds in general, are um, processed through the kidneys. So when you have to give meds like antibiotics to correct the problem to an already damaged kidney, it can be a little tricky. So just making sure you're monitoring that closely. But in order to uh, remove the cause, you got to treat the treat with the antibiotics. So. Um, treatment needs to be supportive. Again, maintaining fluid balance, they, uh, fluid volume excess, so they might need diuretics to promote that diuresis before they go into that diuresis period, and adequate renal blood flow, and I've already mentioned this, IV fluids, potentially transfusion of blood products, and then maybe your pressors like dopamine and low dose, but always fluids first. Dietary management, so they need adequate energy and protein and micronutrients to maintain homeostasis. So we'll talk more about diet too with our chronic um, because protein, other than um, low sodium, low potassium, and low phosphorus, are that's what all renal patients should be on. Protein depends on what type of renal failure they have. So with acute kidney injury, protein is acceptable because they are in a high state of catabolism. They need that protein um, for the adequate energy and to maintain that homeostasis. But when we start talking about chronic renal failure, they should be on more of a low protein because the kidneys can't process it adequately and it can um, build up in the system. <clears throat> um, so those caloric requirements are met with high carb meals because they have a protein sparing effect. And then as I already said, the low sodium, potassium and phosphorus. All right, so we are on to kidney disease. So let's meet back at um, 1020. That's about 15 minutes and we will move on with our chronic kidney disease. Anybody have any questions first though? No? Okay. All righty. <clears throat> All right, so now we are going to talk about chronic kidney disease. Um, just a moment. Sorry, my husband's trying to call me. Hey, I'll call you back. I'm teaching. Is there something you needed? Okay. All right, bye. Sorry, my husband's at the doctor, so I was just making sure there wasn't something important I needed to know. <laughs> okay. So chronic kidney disease, an umbrella term that describes kidney damage or a decrease in the GFR for three or more months. Untreated kidney disease uh, can result in end-stage renal disease. And the stages are based on a normal GFR, which is greater than 125, but as I mentioned, really greater than 90 is considered um, sufficient. <clears throat> So uh, chronic renal failure, it's also called end-stage kidney disease or renal disease, ESRD, or stage five chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> There's a gradual decrease in the kidney function and it has the inability to eliminate those wastes. It's irreversible and most commonly is due to your diabetic nephropathy, uh, nephrosclerosis, glomerular nephritis, and autoimmune diseases and um, hypertension's in there as well, um, contributes with the nep nephrosclerosis. <clears throat> and then your pathophys, so a large portion of those nephrons are damaged. It's a progressive disease and renal insufficiency is classified when 75% of those nephrons are lost 
and end stage is when 90% of those nephrons are lost. So right around in there is when patients start dialysis, sometimes after that 75, but definitely once they reach that 90. <clears throat> so uremia, we already talked about the uremic frost with acute kidney, it occurs with chronic kidney as well, but with your chronic kidney, it tends to be a more terminal stage of it. Uh, it affects all body systems. <clears throat> Why my throat's so scratchy? Um, so diagnostic findings, uh, fluid accumul accumulation. We know that fluid accumulation is a big thing. They're not getting rid of the fluid that they um, have. The kidneys aren't filtering it out. So they have edema and hypertension with um, chronic kidney. Electrolyte imbalances, those can also cause mental changes. Waste products are retained. So they have the elevated BUN and creatinine. And they can have, they'll have anuria or oliguria, or they could potentially have large volumes of urine without waste products. It's much more rare for that occur, uh, but it does at times. So you might have, you really might have someone who has been anuric and now all of a sudden they just start dumping a ton of urine, but it's, there's no waste products in it. It's essentially like water. It's just fluid. No, nothing is really in it. It's still, they're still having those waste products accumulate. It's just they don't have as much of that fluid retention. <clears throat> so they have those acid-base imbalances, metabolic acidosis, rapid deep respiration through rid the lungs of CO2 to correct the acidosis is potentially seen. It'd be if they're in a much more severe state of acidosis. Your normal, um, just everyday chronic renal failure patients aren't necessarily just always going to have rapid respirations. <clears throat> and then anemia because of that erythropoiesis that they're that they are not having anymore. And then calcium and phosphorus imbalances, which we'll talk more about that in the next couple slides. GI, they can have the nausea and vomiting, cardiovascular fluid overload and arrhythmias, especially with high potassium levels. Respiratory, they can go into pulmonary edema with the fluid retention, neuromuscular, confusion and irritability. In psychosocial, they can have decreased concentration as a result of those um, toxin buildup. Build <clears throat> My slides are all over the place. Renal output, the, or renal, their urine output varies. It can be scant to normal, but their specific gravity is gonna vary by the cause. Typically, um, it's gonna, they're gonna have uh, that higher specific gravity because their urine is more concentrated, but if they do happen to be the type of um, renal failure where they're dumping that large volumes of urine without any waste products, it will be lower. BUN and creatinine, of course, will be elevated. Hyperkalemia, which can cause um, those arrhythmias. Metabolic acidosis, because the renal buffering system isn't working. And then they'll have an increase in their blood phosphate and a decrease in the, their calcium levels. <clears throat> so there is, calcium and phosphorus have a reciprocal relationship. When one is high, the other is low. Typically, with our renal failure patients, though, they are going to have high phosphorus. They have that high phosphorus retention because they're not ridding the body of it. When there's high phosphorus, it binds with the calcium, which then in turn um, decreases the calcium. Then there is just kind of a constant cycle. The, when there's low calcium, then the bones excrete uh, their calcium to try and combat it, which will eventually increase the calcium. But then when that phosphate is high, it's still going to continue to, to bind with that calcium to lower it. So it's just kind of a vicious cycle of a high, phos high phosphorus and low calcium. <clears throat> oh, shoot, what did I just do? Ah, did I stop screen sharing? There. Is that normal now? I don't know what I did. My screen got all crazy for a second. Um, I meant to go to the next slide. All right, so emergency medication. So the calcium, if their calcium is significantly low enough, you might need to give some calcium gluconate to correct that. Um, but then with the potassium levels, again, they're going to have those really high potassium levels because it's just being retained in the bloodstream and not being excreted normally. So some measures that we can do to help bring down that potassium level because it can be life threatening with those. Um, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, <clears throat> um, IV dextrose and insulin, primarily the insulin. 
as we already talked about with the diabetes, insulin um, will push potassium back into the cells and will lower potassium levels. So insulin, IV insulin is one way that we get that potassium level to come down. The dextrose just goes along with it to help prevent them from bottoming out their glucose then. The dextrose isn't going to have a significant effect on their potassium, but it's, if they're getting an IV bolus of insulin to bring down their potassium levels, they're going to need some dextrose to follow it. Uh, or talk, I said the calcium gluconate. And then the sodium polystyrene. That sodium polystyrene is that K-exalate. Um, that K-exalate, I should use the generic name more. Um, the sodium polystyrene is that like milky, like chocolate milk looking stuff, if you guys have ever had the opportunity to give it, uh, that will cause the patient to have a bowel movement. So it will bind to the potassium and excrete it through the bowel, through bowel movement. So it is given, you know, in order to act through the GI tract. So of course, things that you wouldn't want to give uh, KX late for is if they have a bowel obstruction or an ileus, no bowel sounds, those type of things. If they can't eat or they're potentially in um, like a too lethargic state to take it for you, it could still potentially given through an NG tube or something. Um, it's not, there's not like an IV form of it. So it does need to get, be give orally but the absolute contraindications for giving it would be those reasons that it can't be given through the GI tract. So again, like obstruction, ileus, no bowel sounds, those type of things. <clears throat> and then um, albuterol works similar in the way that insulin does as it pushes the potassium back into the cells. However, so they might get breathing treatments in order to bring down their potassium levels. However, these patients, if they're tachycardic for any reason, that would be contraindicated for them because you don't want to give them medication that's going to make them even more tachycardic. And then they might potentially need um, <clears throat> um, bicarb if they are acidotic enough. So our maintenance medications then, um, this includes our calcium and phosphorus. So calcium, as I already mentioned, because they have low calcium levels, and then phosphorus is given when, um, when they eat because there's a lot of phosphorus in food. So the phosphorus binders does just that. It binds to the phosphorus in foods. So that way it doesn't raise their, um, their phosphorus levels and in turn hopefully balances out their calcium levels as well. So that way it binds to the phosphorus instead of the phosphorus binding to the calcium. And um, if they aren't eating, <clears throat> then they wouldn't necessarily need to be taking their phosphorus binders, um, but calcium <coughs> generally is gonna be taken um, every day to help improve their calcium levels. So that Sevolimer is our common um, phosphorus binder medication. Sometimes they'll take it, you know, maybe they'll take like three or four with meals and then maybe they, just like one or so with a snack. But if they're not eating, they don't need to take that phosphorus binders because it just, it binds to the phosphorus in foods. Lots of foods are high in phosphorus. Um, <clears throat> soups are a big one, but really they should be avoiding soups anyway, because oftentimes they're on a fluid restriction and soups have a lot of sodium in them too, and they should be on a low sodium diet. Um, but soups have a lot of phosphorus and actually milk. Milk and milk products have a lot of phosphorus as well. So it's kind of a double-edged thing because it's high in calcium, which would be good for them, but it's high in phosphorus, which isn't good. So um, they, just need to be aware of that when they're making dietary choices. Uh, and then they have their antihypertensives. Oftentimes our chronic renal failure patients are hypertensive because of the fluid uh, accumulation or fluid retention, but specifically ACE inhibitors are a common um, antihypertensives that renal patients are on because it helps spare the kidneys, uh, but it does, those ACEs can cause potassium retention. So again, potassium still needs to be monitored closely. <clears throat> erythropoietin, so our epigen, the, they lack that erythropoiesis, so they need that medication to um, help with that. So with the, your um, epigen, they often will have specific parameters. Usually it's just given, it can be given sub-Q or IM, but to, you know, typically in the hospital setting, it's often given IV and it'll be like on dialysis days. It might have it, or if they're not on dialysis, it might just be a few times a week. 
Um, but there'll be specific parameters. Hold if um, hemoglobin greater than 12 or hematocrit greater than 37. So you have to make sure you're checking those lab values because you don't want to give those erythropoietins if they already have good levels because the higher you make that, they, then the higher risk that they have of um, clotting. So you don't want to increase the risk of getting like DVTs or something. So there'll be specific parameters for giving that erythropoietin. Um, and anti-seizure meds. So they'll be on anti-seizure meds oftentimes just prophylactically. Dialysis, I keep saying dialysis, renal patients are more prone to seizures because of the toxic buildup that they have. So they might just be on some of those seizure medications pro prophylactically. It always, I swear, it kills me how many patients just like, they'll just take whatever their doctor prescribes and don't like question it at all. And then they come to the hospital and you're like, I have this, your hypertensive med, your, your blood pressure med, this, that, and the other, and I've got your seizure meds and da, 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 da. seizure meds. I'm not on any seizure meds. Like, well, you, you do you take this Keppra? Yeah. I, I'm like, well, that's a seizure med. That's to prevent you from having seizures because of, you know, your potential for seizures with your kidney failure. And oh, okay. I swear. And who knows, maybe some of them have been educated. They just don't remember anything because I understand that too. But anyway, so just educating your patients just is really beneficial. Um, and then we have um, iron. So iron is also important with anemia. We know that. The problem with iron and the phosphorus binders is to, technically they both should be given, well, the phosphorus binders for sure need to be given with food because they need to bind to the phosphorus in the foods. Iron we know shouldn't be given on an empty stomach, so typically we give it with food. However, you don't wanna give your iron and your phosphorus binder together because they can uh, prevent each other from um, the body absorbing them correctly. The, especially the phosphorus binders can prevent the body from absorbing the iron. So generally you, if they're given or ordered, you know, like at the same time, maybe give your phosphorus binder when they're eating and then a half hour or an hour later, you could give your iron just so they're not taking it on an empty stomach. <clears throat> um, other things, um, if they, um, they also have high magnesium, our renal patients have high magnesium levels. So they should avoid antacids uh, because antacids have a lot of magnesium in them as well. I don't have that on this, on this slide, but really they should avoid antacids. Um, anything else I wanted to say about the meds? No, I think that's it. Okay. <clears throat> so diet. So as I already mentioned with the acute kidney injury, some of those things are still going to apply to the chronic other than protein. Protein is what is the biggest difference with um, these ones. So, or with our chronic versus our acute. So high calorie, but low protein. So if they are in renal failure, but not on dialysis, they should have a low protein diet. Now, when they're on a low protein, it's because their body can't, um, or the kidneys can't, can't adequately break down that protein. And if they have a high protein, it's just going to accumulate in the system and um, can cause <clears throat> um, loss, or I'm sorry, worsening renal failure. So, but if they're on dialysis, they can have protein because protein, it's not that dialysis pulls protein out, but it's lost in the filtration system. So, Acute kidney injury, higher protein, chronic renal failure, low protein, chronic renal failure with dialysis, higher protein. Okay, so the protein, it just depends on what their diagnosis is. But regardless of what type of renal failure, they should still have the low sodium, low potassium, low phosphorus. Those are the big things sodium, potassium, phosphorus, low low of those things. Then they're going to have their vitamins and stuff as supplements, um, increased calcium, but also primarily they're going to get a lot of that with their calcium supplements as well. <clears throat> and fluid restriction. Of course, fluid restriction is important. Strict to INOs, making sure 
they're not drinking too much and since they're not able to um, rid themselves of the fluid adequately. So sometimes it has to be a, a balancing act. If they've had a, if they are in a significant renal failure that they are at least still voiding, then they might be able to have a little bit more fluid than a, a patient who is no longer voiding at all, that they're just completely aneuric. All right, <clears throat> so nursing management, monitoring fluid and electrolyte balance, um, reducing the metabolic rate, promoting pulmonary function, preventing infection, providing skin care, especially if they get into that like uremic frost state, um, and providing psychosocial support. Preventing complications is always hyperkalemia, um, which the hyperkalemia can definitely be one of the most life-threatening um, if it gets to be significant enough, metabolic acidosis, pericarditis, pulmonary edema, high serum phosphate levels, and dialysis. So when it gets to the point that they are no longer able to um, effectively remove any fluid and they're not responding to medications, hemodialysis is basically their last option. And then our CRRTs, which we'll talk about in a few um, in a few slides. So our CRRT is our chronic renal replacement therapies. In meds, so we know that drug therapy is always a challenge because of two thirds of the drugs and their metabolites are eliminated by the kidneys. So that's often why medical management alone doesn't do the trick and they have to go into dialysis. So dialysis is essentially our um, uh, artificial kidney. <clears throat> so dialysis is when symptoms are life-threatening um, or just for maintenance as well. Fluid overload, high potassium, neurological signs, and uremia. The main goals of dialysis are to remove the products of that protein metabolism, control the potassium, um, and removing that excess fluids. <clears throat> So usually it takes um, four hours, at least three to four days a week. So if someone's on a maintenance of dialysis, generally it's three days. Oftentimes it's like either a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday type of routine. Um, but it usually does take about four hours. And it can be um, for patients who are acutely ill too. So our acute kidney injury, they might need to be on dialysis for a while until things get corrected. Um, but then it's also our end stage patients as well, as we know. Um, dialysis is um, <clears throat> very rapid. So we need specific access for, a di for dialysis. You can't just use like a regular central line or your normal like vein and artery. So with dialysis, it moves, it removes blood or filters the blood through at 500 mill milliliters a minute. So it's like super large volumes very quickly. So um, if you would have just like a normal um, vein and artery that wasn't, that's not like attached somehow, they will just collapse on themselves. It can't handle that rapid amount of blood being moved through. So temporary access is either our Quentin and our perm cath, which is just a catheter that's placed subclavian, jugular, um, or femoral. And Quintin is our even more temporary, temporary access. And then our perm cath, as, as the name implies, perm, is a little bit more permanent. Usually, like maybe six months um, at the most, but our perm cath is a tunneled catheter. So they can typically can go home with their perm cath until they either decide whether or not they're going to need to continue with dialysis or they need a, an AV graft or fistula. So the perm cath um, is more permanent and then your quintin is gonna be used more in like your emergent situations. It's, it's essentially a much more large bore central line that is specifically used for dialysis. And it can be in the femoral vein um, if they are having trouble getting access elsewhere. Your perm cath will never be in, in the, the fem. But your quintin could potentially be, but if it is in the femoral vein, since it is such a large bore uh, line, uh, they need to be on strict bed, bed rest. They don't want to get up and like kink it or, you know, it break or something like that. So they need to be on bed rest if it's in the femoral vein. <clears throat> so 
Then you have your AV graft and your fistula. Your graft is um, access, but it's with a synthetic like tube that joins the vein and the artery together. And whereas your fistula is when the vein and the artery are sewn together completely. Um, the good thing, let me go to, okay, so here's our quentin. It looks just like our perm cap, but the only difference with our perm cap is it's got that little cuff because that perm cap is tunneled and then that cuff is there to help prevent, you know, that develops a little bit of scar tissue around it and prevents bacteria going to that uh, central line. Whereas the quentin doesn't have that, it just goes directly into the access. So your quentins generally shouldn't be, aren't left in longer than a week. And if they need it, a, a new one, they'll just replace it and put a new one in. Because So your quintins, you treat much like your central lines that you don't want to leave them in place too long. But your perm cap, you can. And looking at the outside of them, as you can see, I mean, they look almost exactly the same. Uh, so unless you know specifically, or it says like right here on the hub of it, what it is, don't ever just pull it uh, because obviously you cannot just you can't remove a perm calf at the bedside so whereas quintins you as the bedside nurse properly trained nurses can remove a quintin but a perm calf does need to be removed in surgery since it is a tunneled catheter <clears throat> so but your fistulas in your graph so here you can see the first one is just your fistula where your vein and your artery are sewn together and, and then astomosis is created and then your graft is a graft that connects the two together. Generally, um, unless it's a thinner patient, um, you may not always be able to tell what, what they have, if they have a graft or a fistula. Uh, sometimes you can specifically like see the, the graft underneath the skin and you can feel it and it's hard. Regardless of what they have, you're still always going to assess for a brewery and a thrill. You're gonna hear the brewery and feel the thrill. So either one will have the same thing. It just kind of depends on their anatomy, um, you know, how, if they can do a fistula. Fistula is the preferred uh, because it, they don't need um, as much of that hep heparinization afterwards and it doesn't clot as easily as a graft does. Um, oftentimes when, you know, people just call it a fistula, even though it's really a graft, um, but either way, you're going to assess them the same. You're still not going to do blood pressures or IV sticks in that arm. Regardless, you're going to treat it the same. It's just a different, a different option. Um, so, and I, I have found out that apparently it's regional as far as like what you call it. Cause here, I, everybody just calls them fistulas. Like they just say, oh, patient has a left forearm fistula, you know, whether it's a really a fistula or a graft or not, and you just know what they're talking about. When I did travel nursing and I was down in Florida, apparently they call them a graft all the time, <laughs> even, even if it's a fistula. Uh, because I had a patient and I was giving a report and I'm like, well, they have a left forearm fistula and da 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 da, -da going on. And then they're like, wait, a fistula in their arm? And they were like really confused by it. And I'm like, yeah, for dialysis? And they're like, oh, you mean an AV graft? And I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> that. So I guess it's regional. So if you ever do travel nursing and which there's other things that I, I found, it's just, you know, same country, just different parts of the country that call things different things. So, um, so yeah, just a little sidebar. So, but fistulas are still the preferred because of the less likeliness of it to clot. Okay. There's a, you know, an example of your um, fistula. Or graft, I don't know. <laughs> All right, the complications of dialysis. So dialysis is going to remove a lot of fluid, hopefully. Um, that's the idea over that few hour time frame. So hypotension and dehydration, of course, are a potential complication of dialysis. So you need to be monitoring for that. Typically, though, they're pretty hypertensive. Um, oftentimes, our dialysis patients or renal failure patients are hypertensive. Um, so hopefully it just lowers their blood pressure, but they don't go hypotensive. But some, some do happen to be hypotensive and they might even need um, medication prior to dialysis to help bring their blood pressure up so that way they don't bottom out um, afterwards. But blood loss is definitely a potential complication, especially um, as I already mentioned, five 
hundred milliliters a minute is going through that, that dialysis machine. And that filter stores about 500 milliliters. So if for whatever reason they clot off or something happens that they can't, um, what's called rinse back that, that blood back to the patient, they can lose almost a liter and a half, not a liter, um, a unit and a half of blood um, by it not being able to get, get that back. So blood loss is a potential cramping just with the rapid fluid removal and electrolyte changes. Disequilibrium syndrome, um, that is when the, uh, the cerebral fluid shifts in the brain occur and it can cause like seizures. And um, so if they start to have complaints of a headache or nausea and vomiting, those type of things, it could cue you in that they should slow down um, with the dialysis because it's causing that disequilibrium syndrome. And you of course don't wanna, it could be potentially life-threatening and you don't want your patient to start uh, seizing and go unconscious. And um, hepatitis B, I think almost every patient gets screened for hep B with every dialysis run now. In using the machines and the filters and stuff, I mean, I think it's pretty much less common anymore, but uh, it is still potential that they can have develop hep B as a result of dialysis. And then dysrhythmias, they go along with um, <clears throat> the electrolyte imbalances and the changes and the frequent shifts with the fluid and everything, they can have some dysrhythmias as well. And there's a lady just so happy to be there, chilling, getting her dialysis. All right, so now we have CAPD, our peritoneal dialysis. Our CAPD stands for continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. So it's still peritoneal dialysis, but if you ever hear it called that someone is on CAPD, that's what they are on. They're on peritoneal dialysis. It's a continuous dialysis done by the patient at home, and it's where the peritoneal membrane is um, the semi-permeable membrane across which waste fluids move from the blood. So they're able to use that peritoneal membrane to pull fluids out of the blood and into um, that peritoneal cavity, and then it's able to be drained to remove the waste products. So that peritoneal catheter, uh, the common one that's used in this area is called a 10 cough. So you might hear that called that a lot. They have a 10 cough catheter. It's a peritoneal catheter and it's placed in the peritoneal space between two layers of the peritoneum below the waistline. So here is what CAPD looks like. So you have your indwelling bag Usually it's around a, a two or three liter bag, somewhere around there. And it's a specialized, um, it's specialized fluids that then when they're instilled into the abdominal cavity, it pulls the waste products out, um, out of the bloodstream into the, into the abdomen. And then you drain it after it's been dwelling, maybe sometimes like 30 minutes to an hour. It really depends every, you know, physician orders a little bit different depending on the patient's needs, and then you drain it. And then you um, assess the fluid that has been drained because it essentially should look like urine um, and you weigh it. Now, we used to do this manually, just like this. And it used to have like four bags on like a big IV pole, look like a big old, like a big Christmas tree full of two liter bags um, that you put one in, let it drink, let it dwell, drain it, and you just like kind of do it all night long um, for the patient. But now they've got fancy little machines that do all the work for you. So literally the dialysis nurse sets it all up and you just monitor and make sure there's no problem. So it's pretty handy, but it is um, potential that if worst case scenario, it doesn't have to be done with the machine. It is essentially can be done by gravity. Um, but since it is in the peritoneal cavity, there are some patients that uh, would not, would be, it would be contraindicated for. So patients that are, um, have had a lot of abdominal surgeries that have a lot of scar tissue, aren't usually good peritoneal dialysis candidates, uh, obese, severely obese, like especially in the midsection are not good candidates because um, the, they're indwelling all that fluid and also fluid is being pulled into the abdomen. So it can make it really difficult for them to breathe if they already have a large 
you know, abdominal region. And along with that too, the um, COPD patients sometimes aren't good candidates because of, again, the breathing and all the fluid and everything that can push up against the diaphragm. It can make their breathing more difficult. Um, and then it is, that 10 cough catheter is a, needs to be sterile and connecting the bags and everything to the, um, even if it is a machine and they just connect themselves and turn on the machine and go to bed, it still is a sterile procedure as far as connecting everything because it's a catheter that's going directly into the peritoneal cavity. So they're at a high risk for developing peritonitis if it's not done correctly. So they need to have good cognitive skills in order to do this. So someone who's confused or has any type of dementia or anything would not be a good candidate for um, peritoneal dialysis. Um, so you as a nurse and, and or even instructing the patient needs to be aware of those signs and symptoms of peritonitis since it is a very uh, common potential complication. So as I mentioned, it should, the outflow of the fluid should look like urine essentially should be like a bleh, clear yellowish color. Um, but if it starts just like with a UTI, if you see cloudy urine, it can indicate a UTI. Well, cloudy outflow from this bag can indicate peritonitis. So if you no start to notice any signs of cloudy outflow in that fluid bag, you should be notifying the physician. A little bit of blood tinge would be normal, especially if it's a newer catheter, um, but really just the cloudiness is what you really wanna be looking for. And then of course, other signs and symptoms of infection, you know, white count, fever, abdominal pain, those type of things. <clears throat> Does this machine thing look almost like a rolling cart and then have yeah. like a big fluid bag on top of it? Yeah. Would that be what that is? Okay. I was just curious. I've seen it once and I wasn't, I was so confused. I had no idea what it was and I didn't know what it was for. Now I know. Yep. This is it. Yeah. Hey, Lindsay. I used to, yeah. I'm sorry. Just a quick question. So when somebody's on dialysis, if they got a lot of edema and they pull quite a bit of fluid out of them, can you see it right away? Or why would you not see it right away if they were, you know, pretty swollen? Um, yeah, you can. I mean, it depends on how much they can, it depends how much they can remove and depends on how much fluid is on board. I mean, if they are severely edematous, um, one round of dialysis, usually they're not going to remove much more than maybe like three kilos would be about the most. And I mean, some of these patients, I, they go, especially if they're in an acute, um, exacerbation of it, they might go to dialysis like every day for the week, uh, you know, more than just like your, their three times a week. So if they're removing like two to three kilos every day, you may not notice it initially, but then as the week progresses, you're going to start seeing it much more. Um, but what you should be noticing is that, you know, their breast sounds, because it's going to remove it more centrally first, as opposed to peripherally. So you hopefully should notice that they have like less crackles in their lungs, you know, their breathing gets a little bit better. And then, um, you know, hopefully their blood pressure is starting to come down a little bit if they were really hypertensive. So um, you're going to notice it more centrally first than you would peripherally. So if somebody's like in heart failure, just in heart failure, they're, they're going into renal failure, they're intubated, mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't probably notice, right? With one round? Yeah. Probably not. I mean, if they're in a severe case, yeah, you probably wouldn't notice it. Would that first. be more for like a life-saving support? Yeah. They, so they we'll them. talk. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk here more about our continuous um, dialysis, the CRRT here in a minute. Um, but yeah, definitely if it's like an emergent case, it's going to be more so to correct those life-threatening um, uh, causes of or life-threatening complications of, of renal failure like the like potassium maybe is like seven like we got to get that corrected right away um, so the initial round is you're not going to notice as much of the fluid volume like peripherally and everything but but it's more their lab values that can be life-threatening okay. that you're going to hopefully start to see those changes in yeah okay thank you you're welcome um, so peritoneal dialysis then is uh, done three to four times a day. It is daily. And 
completed three to four times a day is referring to the number of exchanges, the number of bags typically that get exchanged through throughout uh, that period. And it is usually done at night, especially now that um, they have a machine that literally they can just like be hooked up to and go to bed and it'll just like do it for them throughout the night is super beneficial. So then they wake up in the morning and they can disconnect their catheter and then go about their day, but that it's done every night. So it's definitely, even when it used to be done the old fashioned way with the bags, um, they still would do it throughout the night. Just have to like set alarms to like wake up and do their exchanges and stuff, but at least they could still kind of live a normal life during the day. <clears throat> um, as I already mentioned, it's a sterile technique with that um, catheter. It, the bag is the fill bag and then it dwells and then you drain it. And it usually takes about 20 minutes to drain. If there's any complications that it's not draining, sometimes it's just a matter of like repositioning the patient or making sure that the tubing isn't connected. I mean, just kind of like with your IVs, like if it keeps beeping or alarming, you do some things to troubleshoot to try and make sure it's not like pinched off or something. <clears throat> So here we have our advantages. So advantages of hemodialysis, it's rapid fluid removal. It's done very quickly over a few hours. And then in turn, you have that rapid waste product removal. It has effective removal of potassium, low protein loss. So there's still protein loss with hemodialysis, just not as much as peritoneal. And uh, temporary access can be placed at the bedside. So that Quentin catheter, if it's an emergent situation, they can just place it at the bedside and hopefully get dialysis started as soon as possible. Peritoneal dialysis is never going to be an emergent situation. It's always going to be for your routine um, chronic failure patients. But it is less complicated, less dietary restrictions, less fluid restrictions. It's portable, short training time, less medications. Um, patients with vascular problems would benefit from peritoneal. So if maybe they've got severe peripheral vascular disease and they can't get any good uh, fistula access for a patient, then they might try peritoneal. Um, less cardiovascular stress because it's not as rapid and they can do it at home. Now there, there are um, options for some patients to start doing hemodialysis at home. I personally have not taken care of any patients yet that have this, but I know it's out there now um, that they make like a, uh, like on their fistula, they, they place like, like buttons is like what they're called. So it's essentially they can just hook the dialyzer up to their fish, their buttons on their fistula and can dialyze at home that way. So I know it's an option, but I personally have not seeing a patient come in with those buttons. And I don't even know, I, I personally don't even know if it's like they stay there permanently or if they only put them on like when they start dialysis, like they have to access them, which I would think that would be really difficult. But anyway, it's, it's becoming a thing now that you can do hemodialysis at home. If a patient uh, is getting peritoneal dialysis and like say they get peritonitis, then they need to have hemodialysis, right? If they are like essentially need the dialysis. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, what they generally do is either place a Quentin catheter or a perm cath catheter um, and will dialyze them that way until they can start back up on their peritoneal dialysis. Yeah. Okay. I had a guy in clinical that was like that and they... Um, they tried to place a fistula and then they tried to use it like two days later and they blew it and yeah, it was, it was, they did it at bedside. So I got to see it all. It was really cool, uh -huh. <laughs> but I was really sad. I felt really bad for the guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Generally they, you need to, I mean, generally they wait at least a few weeks before they use a fistula after they placed it, but I don't know. I don't know what his situation was, why they did it. But um, so then here we have our disadvantages. So it kind of goes along with the advantages, but in the opposite. So hemodialysis disadvantages, if they have vascular access problems, they can't do it. Those severe dietary fluid restrictions, lots of medications, heparinization, um, especially if they have that graft. They do still heparinize a fistula a little just to make sure that clots don't form in there, but especially if they have a graft, an AV graft, it needs to be heparinized a lot. And if they have a quintin or a perm cast, those definitely, um, they, and it's not like your normal, um, when they have a central line or a pick line, how you give like 25 units 
of heparin to flush the line. It's like in the thousand, it's like a thousand or something like that. It's a lot. It's essentially like them getting, you know, a heparin sub Q shot. Um, <clears throat> three to four times a week in the clinic for three to five hours. Again, it's starting to be more so at home, but typically most patients do do it at a clinic um, for those hours a few times a week. Hypotension occurs more with hemodialysis and exhaustion. It takes a lot out of them. Peritoneal dialysis then, peritonitis, more protein loss. They can get those exit site and tunnel infections from that 10 cough catheter. Self-image problems, hyperglycemia, weight gain, and it requires specialized training. All right, so now we have our CRRT, or Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy, or CVVH is what it's often called too, Continuous Vasoveno Hemodialysis. Either way, they're both continuous hemodialysis. The C CRRT is used more so um, <clears throat> for it's a temporary dialysis for severe symptoms of uremia. So it is temporary. Uh, you know, someone would never be on it lifelong because it is 24 hours continuously until either they decide the patient is not going to recover or they can become stable enough that they can tolerate regular hemodialysis. So it's still hemodialysis, but it's removing it continuously for 24 hours a day. And what the benefit for that is that it's used for more unstable patients because Patients who are in a severe state of kidney failure, whether it's acute kidney injury or acute on chronic renal failure, they're just in a severe state of that uremia with um, those nitrous, the, all those waste products that have built up and they just need emergently dialyzed, especially if their potassium levels are really, really high or whatever the case may be, um, or they're in severe fluid overload. If they're unstable, they're not going to tolerate regular dialysis because that 500 mils a minute that it's pulling through is way too rapid and they will just tank quickly if you try and do regular dialysis on those patients. So what this does is instead of doing it rapidly over a few hours, it does it much more slowly over the whole 24 hours. So patients that are severely hypotensive, um, those patients, will tolerate your CVVH much more so than they would your hemodialysis. Generally, if someone is hypotensive and they're needing to be on pressors in order to keep their blood pressure up, um, that kind of buys them the ticket that they're going to wind up needing CVVH instead of regular hemodialysis. Um, so it's still done the same way though. It goes through that hemofilter and those excess fluid and solutes go into a collection bag or a collection system. I know, um, like in the ICUs, they have a, like an actual drainage system that, that our dialysis goes into. It doesn't actually go into a collection bag, but sure, it depends where you're at. <clears throat> so um, these patients then um, also, just like I had mentioned before, if they're, if they're an acute kidney injury, they're gonna be more hypotensive and they might need, all they might need is some fluid to correct a problem. So you're still always gonna, if it's hypotension, that's a result of hypovolemia, we're always gonna start with fluids first and then start on the pressors, and then they might need to do the dialysis. Generally, our chronic renal failure are gonna be more hypertensive, but you know, maybe they're in a state of sepsis, that they're hypo, that they have hypotension, that they still wouldn't tolerate um, their normal dialysis for. So the main takeaway with your continuous dialysis is that it's done with your unstable patients. <clears throat> so nursing process, excess fluid volume, monitor their weight, fluid restriction, fluid retention, strict INOs. Gonna always be doing strict INOs on these patients. And electrolyte imbalances, monitoring their um, sodium, protein, albumin, dietary restrictions, and monitoring for dysrhythmias. Um, fluid overload ca can cause right-sided heart failure that can result in distended neck veins because they aren't already in a, in a form of heart failure. Shortness of breath, tachycardia, hypertension, crackles, cold, clammy skin, all those things we're going to be monitoring for. Now, itchy skin, um, impaired hematological function, protecting from infection, monitoring their white count and temperature, monitoring for bleeding. And with dialysis, if they have that fistula, listening for the brewery and feeling the thrill at least every shift, 
We know not to take blood pressure or draw labs in that arm with the um, fistula. Most meds given after dialysis. So when they're, now obviously those that are on the continuous dialysis, you're, you're giving meds regardless. Um, it's just they're likely gonna be um, moved out quicker since they're getting that continuous dialysis. Um, but generally for normal hemodialysis, you wait to give their medications until after dialysis because they're just gonna be dialyzed right out. Um, there are certain medications that might say give before dialysis, like for those patients who, um, midodrine is one of them. It's like a common medication that is given before dialysis to prevent their uh, uh, blood pressure from getting too low during dialysis. <clears throat> but dialysis does not remove bacteria, red blood cells, or protein. Um, but as I mentioned before, protein is just lost in the process. So it doesn't remove it, but it is lost. So they can be on a little bit higher um, levels of protein in their diet. All My right. fiance was on um, continuous. He had some valve problem in his heart. Both his lungs were collapsed so, and his kidneys were failing. So he was on the continuous and he was on ECMO and they had him in a prone bed. Oh my gosh. So, How lots long ago of was lines and, and a trach. Um, 2013 was his accident. I think it was 2014 or 15 wow. when he was on all that. Yeah, because he got real. I don't know. I, we weren't together at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, he was, he got some rare virus. I don't know what it was. And he got really sick and they had to put him on all that stuff and they had him in Indy. Wow. Well, yeah. He's lucky to be here. Wow. That's crazy. Um, <clears throat> so last, I think this is the last one when it comes to our renal stuff other than transplant. Lastly, we have our nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, um, it's a group of symptoms and it's where the glomerular capillaries are damaged from immune complex deposits, nephrotoxic antibodies, or non-immunological -immun insults. It's characterized by proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, and edema. So nephrotic syndrome, the biggest, those are the biggest characteristics that kind of helps differentiate it between, you know, other kidney failure is they have severe protein urea. So the protein levels in the urine are so high that it almost causes like a, a frothy, foamy looking urine. And because they're dumping so much protein in their urine, they have severe hypoalbuminemia. So they have really, really, really low albumin, blood albumin levels because it's being dumped into the urine at, uh, at alarming rates. So normal albumin levels, it's the same as like your potassium, 3.5 to 5. So they have just severely low albumin levels. Um, but in order to diagnose it officially, it, they need to have a renal biopsy. <clears throat> so again, large amounts of protein are lost in the urine um, from the increased glomerular membrane permeability. The protein um, that's normally reabsorbed through the renal tubules and then the urine protein, the normal readings, are zero to very low, like I said, less than that 0.8. Um, if protein is found in the urine, irreversible kidney damage has occurred. So um, it's kind of confusing because, I mean, we all know like either you've been pregnant and had protein in your urine, you know, so it can be a sign of preeclampsia and everything um, and think, oh my gosh, I've had irreversible damage because I had protein in my urine when I was pregnant. But protein molecules are so big and it can damage the nephrons as it's going through and if it's dumped into the urine. But again, if you go back to, we have 2 million nephrons and we can have just fine kidney function with 500,000. So even if some of those nephrons have been damaged when protein has gone through, you doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have kidney failure later in the future. So it's just some of those nephrons have been damaged as the protein moves through. Um, so the diagnostic test is a 24-hour urine specimen. They'll do that creatinine clearance and then um, that microalbuminuria is the first sign of kidney damage. Oh, this is just a picture that depicts it. And so signs and symptoms, hypertension, edema, and some other factors that they're going to have that your typical renal failure patient doesn't always have is the elevation of their um, lipid profile. So their serum cholesterol, their LDLs and triglycerides 
are all going to be elevated because when there's a loss of those plasma proteins, a loss of that albumin, um, the, then it starts to stimulate those lipoprotein production. So that's why those levels will be more elevated in these patients. Again, the decreased albumin, and they're still going to have the elevated BUN and creatinine. And even though their urine has that, a lot of protein and it's got that foamy appearance, it's still going to be low urine output. <clears throat> So you're gonna control the edema with diuretics, a low sodium diet, controlling the hypertension, monitoring the, the urine for protein. And so now with protein with your nephrotic syndrome patients, their protein needs to match the amount that has been lost in the urine with their intake. So going back to the protein again with diet, your acute kidney injury, protein. Chronic renal failure, low protein, unless they're on dialysis, high protein. And then nephrotic syndrome, match the protein. It's the amount lost with the amount intake. It needs to, needs to match. And then medication. So furosemide, you know, our typical diuretics, our ACE inhibitors, again, more so for a hypertension with our renal failure patients. Heparin and warfarin, um, they'll be on these. Sometimes nephrotic syndrome can be a result of a, um, uh, a clot, a, a clot in the kidneys. Why am I drawing a blank on it? Renal thrombus. There you go. That's the proper term. Um, it can be a result of a renal thrombus or it can cause a renal thrombus. So either way, they'll be on that um, heparin and warfarin. And then um, your procrit, your epoetin, same reasons that your renal failure patients are on it to help improve their erythropoiesis. Um, antibiotics, especially if it's a result of an infection of some sort, and then steroids to help with, you know, inflammation. Okay. Oh, I forgot to pull up my um, kidney. Where's my renal transplant? Where's it at? There it is. All right. Last, but not, oh, so, what time is it? Well, maybe I won't go over the, I don't have, the renal, um, renal and bladder cancer one is in there. Um, I, I didn't have time to go over it with um, Wednesday's group. But really, it's not, there's not a lot. I don't really elaborate much on it at all. Um, it, it's there, the renal, the bladder cancer one, um, that you guys should look over the PowerPoint. There's not even a recording on it or anything. Um, so just, just there uh, to touch on it, but don't like, don't, for this exam, don't concentrate on it so heavily that you're not concentrating on other stuff. Just review it, be familiar with it, um, but don't go crazy with it. Okay, so renal transplant. So I always mean to put like the statistics for the kidney, um, the number of people waiting on um, the renal transplant list because it's astronomical. The number of people that are waiting for a kidney transplant is, is just crazy. Um, it's the most like waited for <laughs> um, organ probably. Um, more so because you can live without functioning kidney. I mean, you can't, but dialysis. We have dialysis as an option um, to keep these patients alive until they get a kidney transplant. So as already mentioned, you can live with one kidney. So people only need one kidney to live after they get a transplant. And um, the nice thing then too about renal transplants is you can have a living donor because someone can donate their kidney and be just fine for the rest of their lives. So there are lots and lots of people on the list and um, I am actually currently in the process, have been for like a year now, trying to donate one of my kidneys for a friend. We're not a match, but um, IU does this awesome thing where they do shared donation or paired, paired donation to where you can essentially donate your kidney on the behalf of your loved one um, so that way it gets them into another pool essentially of people who are willing to do this to donate their kidney in order for their loved one to get someone else's kidney so it's kind of like a big 
swap, <laughs> so to speak. So if you, you know, uh, and actually we had, a, I had a student, um, I think it's been a year or two ago now that just did, just did it for no reason, just donated his kidney because it, that's just what he wanted to do. What didn't have anybody in mind or not, but you know, so there's, here's my little plug for share your spare because <laughs> there's lots of people out there who need one for sure. All right, so with kidney transplant, um, in the preoperative period, just like I mentioned with heart transplant, uh, any transplant, they need to be educated. They need to know that once they receive the donated organ, they're going to have to be on immunosuppressants for the rest of their life. No questions asked. They have to be meticulous about it, and they can't skip it or they could reject their kidney. Um, however, if rejection does occur, it's not life-threatening, typically. Um, cause all they have to do is just resume dialysis again. So thankfully, you know, unlike someone who rejects a heart, um, there's not a lot of options. You can't, um, live without a heart, uh, but you can live without a functioning kidney as long as you're going to dialysis. So there's different stages or different types of rejection. You have your hyperacute, which occurs within hours of surgery, and it results from the antibody reaction to the donor's antigens. So this rarely occurs now because we have such good matching. Um, there's just very, very specific um, things that go on that make people really good matches. It's not like, you know, the TV shows where it's like, oh, they're, they're, they can donate their kidney to you and it works out perfect and they're in the same hospital even. Oh, you're the same blood type. You must be able to donate. It has way more to do with just your blood type. <laughs> Lots, lots more to do than just your blood type. So um, since we have such good matching now, you know, that rejection, this type of rejection does not occur as often. Um, but if it does, manifestations are urine output stops, examination of the kidney shows a blue flaccid appearance. That's once it's removed. And um, the only correction is just removing the transplanting kidney because for whatever reason, you know, the matching wasn't accurate enough. They're just going to have to remove the kidney. Otherwise, it could be life-threatening or their body's going to keep fighting it. Um, so then they just remove the kidney and resume dialysis until another kidney is available. That is apparently what the kidney looks like after it's been removed, that bluish color. Then you have the acute rejection. So this occurs within days to months after the surgery. Um, the body just mounts an immune system defense to it. So it doesn't happen right away, but it can start to happen a few months later. And then when this occurs, the urine output drops sharply and the buon and creatinine rise. They could have a fever, graft tenderness, and swelling. So the management of this is just to increase their immunosuppressants to try and stop the body from fighting the rejection of this kidney. So it could be, it could have been okay for a while, but now for whatever reason, the body is deciding, oh, I just don't think I like this anymore. So you just hopefully increase the immunosuppressant doses and it'll stop the body from trying to reject it. So hopefully it can be corrected. Chronic then can occur for months to years after surgery. The etiology isn't always known. Um, it could be an immune system response to the donor tissue. Sometimes it can occur from, um, Illnesses, if a patient um, you know, gets really, really sick for whatever reason, and especially if they aren't tolerating their immunosuppressants and can't take them, then they can develop rejection to that uh, transplanted organ. <clears throat> and manifestations would be a gradual decline in the kidney function, the urine output, buon and creatinine. Management, there's just no, there's no specific treatment. Um, other than resuming dialysis until another transplant becomes available, unfortunately. So in the post-op period, after a patient has had a transplanted kidney, um, you're going to use special infection control measures, limiting contact with staff and visitors, wearing a surgical mask, monitoring their white blood cell count, observing for signs of tissue rejection, so fever, redness, tenderness, swelling at the surgical site, elevated white count, Decreased urine output with protein and elevated buin and creatinine, weight gain, and hypertension, which actually hypertension tends to be the first sign of um, rejection, so monitoring that closely. And then you're going to monitor their urine output. You will report if urine output is less than 100 mils an hour. 
So where our normal is 30 mils an hour, this is much, much higher. So it's 100 mils an hour because they really want to make sure that that um, donated kidney is just being adequately flushed through and working properly. And what they generally do is titrate the IV fluids to depend on what their urine output is. So let's say their urine output is 200 this hour. Now we're going to change our IV fluids to 200 an hour. So you're just going to continually adjust that IV rate to match the urine output so that way that kidney is staying adequately hydrated. You will expect to see some blood to urine for several days. Um, with a living donor transplant, that urine flow should begin immediately after revascularization and connection of the ureter. So that, that donated kidney from a living donor has had little to no downtime of not being connected um, to a human body. So it should start having urine output right away. Um, however, with a cadaver, um, <clears throat> They could be in uric um, for two days to a couple of weeks, and they might need dialysis during that time if they are completely in uric. And then you're going to monitor their creatinine clearance, BUN, their urine pH and specific gravity, um, and electrolytes and weight as well. Home care, you're going to measure and record the urine output, uh, notify the doctor if it falls below 600 mils for any 24 hour period. So unlike our, our normal urine output that should be 400 in a 24 hour period, these patients, if it's less than 600 in a 24 hour period, they need to notify their doctor. So you're gonna make sure you're teaching them how to adequately record their urine then you know, send them home with a urinal or a hat if it's a female um, and instructing them how to do it and how to collect 24 hour urine samples. So again, those, those things like voiding for the first time in the morning and then starting the collection after that, um, making sure they're weighing themselves at least twice a week to monitor for fluid retention, drinking plenty of fluids, one to two liters of fluid a day to help keep that kidney really hydrated, and reporting any signs of rejection, making sure they know how to take their blood pressure um, and that that elevated blood pressure can be a sign of rejection. They should avoid crowds and persons with infections for at least three months after surgery. But again, they're going to be on those immunosuppressants for the rest of their lives. So they still need to be mindful of that even after three months. Um, practicing regular moderate exercise, avoiding heavy lifting or contact sports for those first three months. Um, using the shoulder belt, but not just the lap style. So you know, some older cars or some cars that maybe the back seat only has the um, lap belt, they should be using the shoulder belt and um, waiting at least six weeks before sexual activity and the importance of side effects of the immunosuppressant drugs and that again they're going to be taking them for the rest of their life. 